All right, so let's get into the first part of this, which is the explosion. Uh, this is the final res explosion. Uh, this one, I believe, has around 600 million voxels towards the end, or 550 something. Um, it took about 20 minutes to simulate. And the good thing with Axiom 3 is we have CUDA now, right? We also have 16 bit field precision. Uh, the quality is not, you, there's no difference in quality, honestly. And like literal no difference, but it's gonna, it, the, the files are gonna be smaller and it's gonna be a bit faster to simulate. And CUDA will actually, when you ran out of your VRAM, instead of switching to the CPU, it will start using your memory, your system memory here to offload the RAM. And then, uh, uh, yeah, instead of switching, it's still gonna use uh, CUDA here to simulate and not switch, which is cool. All right, so let's make this. Let's make something similar to this. We are actually, uh, it's super simple. We are using three Axiom source shapes and a Cathedral Collider. Now, if you look at explosions, they usually do have a collider or something to push the explosion outwards using pressure. And if we look at real explosions, like uh, this one from Tom Scott, how they did it is using these metal containers where they put the explosive in, and then it, the pressure pushes everything outwards. That's why you need this uh, metal container as a collider. So if following the same logic from real life principles, we can apply this to our explosion. Now, we're, I'm going to make it from scratch just so you guys can see. We're going to be making something like this. Oops, there we go. So something like that. Uh, I believe I had one before as well, which is looking quite cool, especially towards the end. It's getting some nice shapes. And if we look at this one, so this is almost real time. I mean, I know it's not, <laughs> it's 1.6 FPS, uh, but Houdini is slowing this down quite a lot, especially the open GL viewport. And the fact that we are getting this much smoke at you know 30 40 million voxels um right now and and it's this and like you can see it in front of your eyes is quite quite amazing and like if we go a bit lower with the division size and you can see like the details are quite nice right let's go to the beginning simulate uh i always encourage people to cache just cache it because the viewport will not, you can see how fast it goes right now. The viewport won't be slowing it down. Uh, Axiom on its own is super fast, border borderline real time in most cases. So if you just cache it down, it's gonna, it's gonna be a lot faster. And usually I say if, if it takes more than uh, a minute when you're testing, to do something or two minutes, like a minute and a half max, you're doing something wrong, right? So let's do something like this. Also, a uh, good practice is to dis disable all of your simulations. And I will show you how to use uh, scripts as well for to do that for you. So when you simulate and you stop simulating, it will automatically disable this and flush the cache. So uh, your VRAM stays low. All right. Let's do this. We need an Axiom source shape. And I need animation here. Box transform make this bigger, I don't know, two, two, something like that. And axiom solver, 
put this to the second to the source shapes. So these are our source shapes. We will be making probably more uh, for different shapes, uh, source shapes for different types of emitters, like explosions, fires and stuff, uh, like presets. It's going to be faster, but for now, this is the fastest way and most efficient. The first input is for custom VDBs, which we're going to be using in a second. Uh, but out of the gate, this is what you get. Bam. Uh, pretty much real time simulations, right? Uh, especially when you are around 8 million voxels, the viewport is super responsive. And if you file cache this, it's going to be like faster than real time. We are living in the future. All right. So like that, and looking back at the pressure container thing, we need to create a few boxes. Let's see, box, box. Let's make this a bit like that. Box and smaller box. Boolean subtract box. Let's see. Maybe we are a bit too. Oops. No. Stop it. Like that. And All right, cool. So we have a pressurized container now. Uh, VDB from polygons. And we need a collision field and put this into source VDB. And now we're going to have collisions. Hooray. Now <clears throat> we need pressure. That's the first thing we're going to do. Here on the source shape, we have a thing called pressure. If we punch this 20 reset simulation, you will see it's going to balloon out probably a bit too much. Yeah, I think let's see. Let's go to 10 first. Let's go here. Reset. Yeah, there we go. So if you want to see what was actually happening, it was just pushing everything out. So it creates that pressure without the collision. That's how this would look like. Poof. Uh, this is a good way of creating explosions in general, which I will cover in the next tutorial when I'm going to be making a dust explosion using all the, uh, again, looking at the real, real life principles when you use uh, grains and RBD and everything to make it look as real as possible. But then if you use the, those principles in CG, uh, it helps with the realism. Um, all right, let's put this back in, put this to one, actually, copy parameter, base reference, base reference, base reference. So they're all at one. Let's say we start this at 20, animate this down to zero here, start frame. 20. See what we get. Poof. Amazing. Uh, add velocity. Directional. Put 50. 1. Sourcing. This is where we have the velocity and all the sourcing. And on the simulation is where we shape our simulation. Poof. Amazing. Let's put this to CUDA for now and output uh, settings. Where are you? Uh, solver, 16-bit, uh, 16-bit. Bam. Lovely. 
we also won't be needing the velocity. And Axiom will uh, do, it will deactivate empty voxels and kind of do all the, the optimizing you really need to do on volumes uh, on the output. So you don't need to worry about that. All right, so we have a poof like that. Let's add less dissipation. So the poof lasts a bit longer. Beautiful. More buoyancy, so it goes up. Great. Uh, add turbulences. Now this is gonna be a bit extreme. So quite good. The something to note with turbulences is so everything that's here is going to be represented down here. So turbulence one, two, and three. Turbulence three is disabled. Turbulence one, you can see here scale field is set to density, which means that the more density you have, the more this will be multiplied, the disturbance, which means that if our density is super, super high, the disturbance will disturb it more. And when finally, you know, the density starts dissipating, the disturbance will be less effective. You can see it starts slowing down. And this is something that happens in real life. And it's going to give you more control over your simulations. Now, keep in mind that you also have other control fields here. So by default, this is going to be set to scale field. You can change it. You can even say, don't do anything. Or you can, on top of that, use uh, another density and change the, in, uh, the input range. And you have a nice ramp here. Or what I usually do is use velocity. So parts of the simulation that are moving faster are going to be disturbed more. And the ones that are slowing down are not going to be disturbed. We don't need any of this because just scale field density is enough in most cases. Let's change the swirl size. Let's put this to eight. And I think this was set to three. Oops, stop it. So a bit bigger like that. It gives us a nice poof. <laughs> All right. I think the dissipation needs to be even lower or we need more density, but I'll leave it. I'll leave it for now. Let's animate our turbulence for now. Let's go to 420, 421, set this to one and one. I don't know what it was on the actual example, but let's just eyeball this for now. I do think we need more density though. And let's up the pressure. We need more of that puff happening. It's going to be a bit slower now, but it's going to start working better. Maybe even 20. I know like on the final example, I went to uh, like 100, something crazy. So it really pushes it out. Great. Works fine. Probably need more temperature. So it goes up. And you can see how fast it is to shape things. Like I'm not really waiting on anything. I'm just shaping as I go. All right. We need disturbance, two of them. Um, 2.1, 2.8, I think it was. Let's go to here and animate these down over time to, I don't know, something like this. Let's see. Beautiful. Now, way too much. I know. I know what you're thinking. This is wh what happened. Uh, what is happening really is disturbance is tied to the block size. Uh, sorry, 
to the division size, which is so the block, <laughs> the block size of the disturbance is tied to the division size times two. Uh, this is the default. This this is the division size. What I usually do is you can either disable this or I put this to one and the other one I set it to three. And now, once you start lowering the division size, which is what you will have to do uh, in the end, you will uh, this will lower as well. Now, 0 0.06 is, I like it. So I will just disable it. And that way it doesn't change with my division size anymore, which is in a lot of cases you want that, but in a lot of cases you don't want that. So we're getting a lot higher in the voxels now, but you can see we're also getting that nice crispy uh, detail, details that you do want in your simulation. Now, I bet if you start rendering this, uh, that emission shader pass is gonna look pretty, pretty sexy just with this. Uh, this would work quite well already. So we are at 45 million voxels and you can see still working fine. Uh, let's go to, let's keep it for now. Let's do wind, set this to three. I think it was at three and let's set it to minus X. What else do we need? I think that's pretty much it. You can put the confinement to three. And what is confinement? Add small details to the velocity field. There you go. We need, you need the small details in the velocity field. I mean, who doesn't? And let's, let's cache this. We don't need the full hundred frames. I just want to see honestly the first 50. That's where well, since it's so fast, I might just let it sim till the end. Now, a lot of things are going to like, the, like I said, the final sim took up around 20 minutes, right? And you're like, well, but this is going to take a minute. Why did the final take 20? Uh, because I was pushing it a bit in terms of the details and how big it is. It's also going to affect how long it's going to sim. Uh, the final has three emitters, which is going to add to the complexity of the advections and everything. Uh, I added a hundred times more pressure, so it really pushes it out. Pushes it out, and there's one one more secret sauce to this that we need to add. So this by itself is going to work fine. Are we blowing wind in the wrong direction? Oh, it should be. Let's see. Let's preview this. Also, the disturbance is also being cut off by the density, right? So the areas that don't are not as dense are going to get uh, less disturbance. Oof. All right. So the last kind of trick to this, whoop, let's see, the last trick uh, is the time scale. So this will, if we go here, we want to be at two faster and then quite quickly here, go back to one. So let's leave it at one for a few frames. That will give us the kick. Time scale is used to, well, we're not doing anything, are we? Time scale is used to speed things up or slow things down. So for fire, I always do fire at two or three time scale, but keep in mind, it will multiply everything. So in the beginning, we will have a lot of disturbance now, and then it's gonna, it's gonna uh, level itself out you do want that disturbance in the beginning to get that really nice crispy uh, crispiness happening. I think we're blowing the wind in the wrong direction. I'm pretty sure.
But look at that. It looks pretty good, right? Or am I not? Ah, damn it. I'm not flip booking this. I thought I was, though. Hmm. So, yeah, the beginning struggles just a bit just because of you know all the pressure and everything and then once the the emitter one you know when we were uh, animating the density when the emitter goes away uh, it gets quite faster so let's see Oof. yes Oof. it's pretty cool So up to this point, we didn't really need to wait on anything uh, at all. And yeah, looks, it looks pretty cool. I think it, I like it. Also, the viewport looks pretty good, like in terms of how good it looks. If it was, if it was a bit faster, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, but in terms of how good it looks, sometimes it almost compares to render quality. But yeah, that's pretty good. Oof. And that's how you make an explosion with Axiom. And I think we are. What are we doing? X, Y, Z, right? X, Y, Z, that's not X. X is this way. Yep. Let's cache it. A actually, let's see. Uh, I do want to introduce uh, the scripts at this point. So what you can do is, um, I will, what you can do is you can go to the Python shell and, and here, just drag this in here and say dot set and set it to zero. And now you can copy this line, go to your file cache, advance, scripts. Uh, so pre script needs to be set to one. Post script needs to be set to uh, zero. And then there's another one uh, that you can do for uh, the reload uh, geometry and let's go back I'll just copy that one from here you do the same thing you drag it you drag it and then you type press button at the end so you just set it you go to the end press button and make sure that your solver here is set to one and what that will do is, see this is disabled, you start caching, it will activate it, even though it says disabled, it doesn't matter. It will activate it and I'll let it sim, just so we can see if we got the wind direction right this time. Where are we? Hooray. Okay, so it's going to the left. Uh, and now if you go here, solver disabled, right? It's going to enable it, disable it, and then reset it. It's going to press on the reset simulation. That way uh, you can see this is going to be, uh, it's going to flush the memory. All right, so that's how you make the the explosion. I will leave both, both of these examples here for you to try. Uh, and this is obviously the main one with the three emitters, uh, the cathedral here, and then you can sim this one. This will take a lot longer. And if you don't have, uh, if you don't have 20 gigs, uh, you might need to change the division size. But then keep in mind, if you start changing the division size, you will need to change the disturbances and everything accordingly. But just so you know, you can try it out and play around with these ones as well. All right. There's one more thing I wanted to cover here, and that was uh, wedging. 
actually two more things. So if you are in the simulation and you want to multiply this down, let's say here you say multiply 0 0.5, what this will do, it will create this, it will, it will remove the Bezier curve. So don't do it like that. If you want to do it properly, you need to be not here, but it needs to evaluate this expression, which is Bezier, and put 0 0.5 here. Now it will respect the, the curve, but also multiply down, just so you know. It happened before to me, so it might happen to you. The other one is a wedging, right? Because even with this, we were like, well, maybe this is a bit too much disturbance. So if you put down a labs file cache and we say wedging when we want three wedges, I will put this down to be eight just so it's a bit faster. So three wedges, number of attributes, we'll just have one and we will say custom range between. So what, what we want to do is multiply down the disturbance. So we want to have, we want to have minimum value of one and max of 0 0.2. So 0 0.2 will multiply this down, right? So we need to add wedge attribute one. So copy this, go to Bezier and say multiply at wedge attribute one. And I'll do the same thing here. Uh, now, if you run this, it's going to do a few things wrong. And that is all the wedges are going to start at the same time, which will activate uh, the voxels here. So what this actually does, it will reserve this many voxels in the in the VRAM. So it will say, well, if you have 23 million voxels, uh, this is going to take this much VRAM and it's going to allocate it here. You can see that if I press enable, it's going to, oops, it's going to do this little bump. That bump is essentially saying, oh, okay, so I know I will need 32 million voxels. If this is pushed to eight, it's going to bump it up again because it needs more voxels. It's, we, we said more voxels, we need more VRAM now. So if you do that on three times, because this will is using PDG, it's going to open three scene, scenes and it's just going to destroy everything. What you do need to do is unclick simulation, go to scheduling and say one batch at a time. So the reason why I need to do this, because if you go to scheduling, this is grayed out. Unclick simulation, one batch at a time, simulation. And now you say, save in background, save and continue. This will now start caching it uh, and it will do it one step at a time. So it will open up a scene. It's gonna cache it. And then when it's done, I wish we didn't do a uh, hundred frames, but it's fine. It's going fast. So it's going to cache it, cache it, cache it. And then once it's done, imagine this just opened up another Houdini scene in the background using PDG. And then when it's done, it's going to close it down, which means that we're going to get all the VRAM back. And then it's going to do uh, wedge number two and it's going to open the scene back up. So I'll let it, yeah, let's, um, Well, I'll leave it for now and I'll just cut. Uh, I'm just going to leave it so you can see what happens here, but then I'll cut it uh, so it finish. So it's going to finish the other two wedges. 
so 100 and see closes the scene down it's going to open up a new one and it's going to it's going to start again there you go so i will pause it and we are going to come back after it's done okay so it's done wedging so we have our unchanged wedge which was set to one so uh, one divided by this it's going to be the same not divided but multiplied and then the second one was uh, 0 0.5 and then 0 0.25 i think right yeah 0 0.2 sorry so that's what you get so with wedging you can then decide which disturbance will work best for you and you can do that the same for all the other uh, parameters with uh, using this wedge attribute and you can do multiple wedge uh, attributes so it's super useful or you can do it the old-fashioned way where you know essentially <laughs> you duplicate this and you're like yeah this is fine but i want to multiply this down and then do another one uh, that also works but this is uh pretty neat all right so this is the smoke portion uh we went from the effects back to uh, effect smoke Super simple. I won't be recreating it from scratch, from scratch uh, because it's it's quite easy to see what's happening from just from this uh, from from the file. So we have three emitters. Uh, we also have a camera frustrum that is based on the camera, and you set it. You essentially put down axiom source shape. You set it to camera frustrum, and point in the camera. That will give you uh, a bounding box. That's why if you look at the final simulation, especially in the beginning, it will feel like it's being cut diagonally because it is, because that's where the camera frustum is pointing like that. Uh, just more efficient. Otherwise, this would be going up all the way here and we didn't need it. If you look it through the camera, see that's where uh, we are adding a bit of overscan. So it's cutting here instead of here, right? Uh, so emitters, put it in here. Um, the only thing, I guess, special here is the the I forgot what it's called. Uh, the influence, sorry, <laughs> uh, the explosion influence. So in order to do that, if you go back to the explosion effects, there's one is this one is for rendering. It's going to try to do the, the scatter. And the other one is for influence. So I VDB resample everything. So it's super low res instead of this, which is not. So we put it here. So it's super fast. I retime it a bit just so it's five, three frames in the future. And then VDB uh, uh, influence. Sorry, the influence velocity is a bit lower. So here I do rename the velocity. So density needs to be called influence and the velocity needs to be called influence velocity for this to work properly. I will do a 101 tutorial soon about all of this and how everything works. But if you already know and you get it, then uh, good for you. <laughs> but it's very simple. You just need to rename it so Axiom knows uh, that's the naming convention that Axiom uses. So a little switch here. So it happens and then it turns it off. Uh, this is Collider. And another cool thing that I did was I added a blast radius. So this will kind of create that kick on the, on the smoke. I will probably add it in the reference I had for that, for when or how that happens but it's an effect that usually when something explodes like the whole smoke just moves in in a wave you, you you see it in the reference and in the final render but that's how it that was done just poof. so just uh animating it adding point velocity putting it um VDB from polygons, doing the same thing, influence and then influence velocity, and then changing the influence velocity based on, uh, you know, 
how it was looking. And that's it. And then you have your solver here. Um, the only other thing is that uh, I really wanted to have, we needed pre-roll. So this starts at uh, this start frame, which is a lot earlier than what we were starting before. So you need this in order to have, you know, smoke already in the air. I don't know why it's try to calculate it. So yeah, smoke. Uh, you can get away with lower rest smoke as well, just so it's faster. And you will see that, um, which is, uh, this is already fast, but if you don't have a collider, it's going to be even faster. Like that. A collider takes uh, some time to calculate and yeah, but so that's the smoke, nothing too special about it. Just go through the settings, you know, just experimenting with different turbulences and disturbances and that, that was pretty much it. And then you clamp, uh, I was clamping the density here just so you get a bit nicer wispiness to it. Otherwise CG smoke, and it's still difficult to not get it to look CG, but this will definitely help. Trail effect. Now, uh, Matt did the setup for this one, and he used a solver to create essentially a simplified particle system. So you don't need to use this. Uh, again, I will do a one-on-one -on -one tutorial on how to do trails. Uh, for now, just know that you know you have essentially three, like a you have a box. You put some points into the volume. You add an initial velocity. You place it in three different places where we had our emitters. Add more random velocity, and then through the solver, it's just gonna do a particle like a simple pop simulation. Instead of this, you could just do a pop network for sure. Uh, and then trails for substepping. You rasterize it. You have density and temperature. Right. You. Uh, merge them uh, using the same smoke as the influence and then you put it into the solver you solve it and that's what you get again be, uh, i encourage you guys to just try and play with uh, these as much as you want so super simple setup clamp the density and then pyro bake you need it to get the the edges to glow because uh, when you use uh, fire or scatter, because of that temperature, it's going to be giving you that glowy edge, uh, glowy end that you need. Yeah, cool.